All right. Well, we have a new series we're starting, and uh, it's called In My Feelings. <laughs> have you guys ever heard of that? Did I catch phrase or you're in your feelings, in my feelings? Um, so this is used when uh, your feelings uh, control your thoughts and actions. And sometimes I'm in my feelings. Sometimes you guys are in your feelings. But what we're going to do in this series, it's going to be a four-week series. So we're not going to be talking about, you know, every feeling under the sun. But we are going to evaluate uh, common feelings of the Christian. And we are going to look at those feelings and evaluate them to the Word of God. Because we want... Um, we want a scripture to inform our feelings, right? Not the other way around. And sometimes the other way around happens, and, and that's not good. So we want to look at the, these feelings uh, that we have and look at them through the lens of scripture. So today, the title of the message is, When You Don't Feel Saved. John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. The majority of Christians um, at some point have doubted their salvation. And you think, you know, am I really saved? Or what if, you know, my last action is a sin? Would I still go to heaven or like... I mean, I grew up, like if you grew up watching some left behind movies or the books, you're like, could I be left behind? Like, I hope I'm not left behind. Whenever the first Thessalonians 4.17 rapture happens, right? So I think this is a feeling that, that we've all had when you don't feel saved. And so we're gonna really um, let scripture, John 6, 35 through 40, inform this feeling. And I hope it's good for you. Um, I hope it's good for you down the road. I'm sure after this message today, those who are saved will feel definitely saved. Um, but then it comes down the road, hey, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you might doubt your salvation. And even for other people in our lives, you know, um, hey, we, we, the question comes up, can you lose your salvation? You know, what about the person that we know who was formerly a Christian, um, but now they've fallen away? They don't seem to be practicing the faith, or um, they're in another religion now, and they've denied God. Uh, what about that person? Uh, so these are some of the questions that we will answer today. Um, so if you have a Bible, John chapter 6, uh, let's open it up there, and we will read John 6, 35 through 40. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So uh, in, in John chapter 6, um, Jesus is talking to people from the crowd um, who ate the, the fish and ate the loaves of bread. So if you see the start in John chapter 6, it's the feeding of the 5,000. So these are the folks that he's talking to, um, they have seen this miraculous sign um, that Jesus fed all these people uh, with just two fish and five loaves. And so he continues talking with them about bread. 
Now, one thing that was uh, striking to me that I got a little later in the week was in verse 12, John chapter 6. It says, so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And so I I used to just think, okay, well, yeah, they, they needed the leftovers and they needed to gather the leftovers in the basket. But I didn't really make the connection to John 6, 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing. So that miracle, that feeding of the 5,000 and making sure nothing was lost uh, is a foreshadow that Jesus will not lose any genuine believer. So this is the context of the passage that we'll be teaching today. And in John chapter four, um, Jesus told the Samaritan woman, I am living water. And now in John chapter six, he says, I am living bread. And so Jesus is not saying that, you know, we don't need the essentials of life, but he's emphasizing an important spiritual truth. And that spiritual truth is, I am all that you need. Jesus is saying, I am all that you need. You guys, you're following me because I fed you and now you're seeking another sign. Um, and then, so I say, hey, I am the bread of life. And you know, John chapter four, the Samaritan woman at the well looking for water. Jesus says, I'll give you living water. So of course, for our bodies, we need the essentials, right? We need bread, we need water. Um, but if you're missing the most essential thing, a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're missing the point. And so that's what Jesus is saying. I am all that you need. You know, there are many things in life that we want. There's a lot of things that I want, you know, for my family, uh, for this church, uh, for myself. Uh, But Jesus is saying, hey, I'm all that you need. Yeah, bread and water, you know, that helps you survive and you think you need all these other things to survive. But Jesus is saying, look to me. I am living bread. I am living water. I am all that you need. That's a word for someone today. They're like, Pastor, you can go sit down now. I got my word for the day. Well, I want to teach you a little more. But, but if you can take away, hey, I am, Jesus said, I am all that you need. Seeking after all these different things, whatever it may be, I am what you need. So you go to verse 37 and you go to verse 39 and these verses deal with the eternal security of the believer. So Jesus is saying, I am all that you need. Come to me and you'll never hunger, come to me and you'll never thirst, and then he gives us this assurance uh, that when you come to me, you will not be cast out. John six thirty seven. it says, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Do you guys see that in the Bible? All right, then you go to 39, Jesus says, hey, I am the bread of life. I will nourish you, I will sustain you. I will be what you need. I will give you endurance. I will give you hope. I'm the love that you need. I'm the comfort that you need. And Jesus says, if you come to me, in verse 39, there's another promise of eternal security that all he has given me, I should lose nothing. So if you come to me, you will not be cast out. If you come to me, you will not be lost. So the invitation stands, come to me. Come to me for salvation. Those of you who need salvation, those of you who need hope, come to me. And those who are weary, come to me. Come. So these verses, they deal with uh, the keeping power of God. So I need to um, give you guys a truth, and I want you to internalize this truth and write this down. 
Um, you may already know this truth, but this truth will inform the rest of this message. And the truth is from John 6, 37 and John 6, 39. It's that if a person genuinely comes to Jesus, they can't be lost. So if a person genuinely comes to Jesus, they cannot be lost. Okay, so we're going to talk about some hard stuff today, but if you, if you have that, if a person genuinely comes to Christ, they cannot be lost. That will help inform uh, the rest of our message. And they call this the eternal security of the believer, but it's, it's the keeping power of Jesus. Jesus has the power to keep you. So when you don't feel saved, when someone else you know you may be talking to, they say, hey... I don't feel saved, you have to ask yourself or that other person the question, do you believe Jesus has the power to keep you? Can Jesus keep you? I know what you feel, but can Jesus keep you? John 6, 37 says, by no means you'll be cast out. 6, 39, Jesus says, I, I can't lose anything. And do you believe that Jesus can keep other people? You know, so even if I'm not doubting my salvation, there's people that I know that I'm like, oh, wow, are they going to heaven? I'm not really sure. Do you believe that Jesus can keep them? I think I told this story once before, uh, but I know there's a lot of new people, so I'll just tell it again and make some application. So when I was at uh, UW in college, uh, I led a Bible study. It was the first type of ministry that I ever did, and the Bible study was called uh, Keeping It Real for Christ. Uh, stand for KRC. And so we're at KRC, and basically uh, on the campus, me and some uh, other college students, we would, you know, promote the Bible study and uh, hand out flyers to everyone and sometimes do some outreaches at UW and have, like, barbecues and free hot dogs and stuff like that. And then the pastor of my church at that time, he would come teach the college students. So we would have all of these topical, you know, um, kind of questions um, that, that, that engage college students, and the pastor was brilliant, and he would just come in and teach. So this was KRC, Keeping It Real for Christ. It was an awesome ministry that I was a part of. Well, at KRC, there was um, a girl who was very involved. Uh, her name was Chocolate. And so Chocolate uh, served on the leadership team. She always came. She was very committed. I remember... Uh, on one day, we had this question like, what about other faiths? You know, like uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff like that. And we even had some Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses come. And so in the Bible study, there was like a little bit of debate. And so Chocolate was fiercely defending her faith. Like girl was on point. She knew the word. And so, you know, so yeah, she was a big part of the Bible study. So, but one thing about Chocolate that always kind of concerned me some, uh, just with the whole 1 Corinthians 15, 33, a bad company corrupts good character, and not really to call someone bad, but just that um, her roommate and her best friend in college was Muslim. And so I think like, hey, yeah, be friends with, you can be a friend with a Muslim, a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, an atheist, non-believers, like, yeah, be friends with them so you can reach them. But if your best friend, like someone who has like is in your inner circle, like has that much influence on your life, it can be a little concerning. So we have to evaluate, hey, who are our closest friends? Are our cl- closest friends bringing us closer to Christ or are they bringing us away from Christ? And so I think I talked to her about that. But anyways, uh, this was her roommate. They roomed together. Um, it was her best friend. So years later, um, I, was, uh, I was traveling, and I was in an airport, and I saw a chocolate in the airport. And we had graduated from college. And she was surrounded by her friends, girlfriends, and all of them were wearing Uh, the Muslim dress, the hijab. And when she saw me, she did look kind of surprised. And my friend was like, I don't know if she wanted to see you. But uh, I saw her, 
And when I saw her, I was like, okay. So I went up to give her a hug, right? Like you embrace your friends. And then her girlfriend stopped me and they said, she can't hug a male. She can't hug a male, not in, with, with the faith that we're practicing. And so I was like, okay. So I said, hey, can we talk? And she's like, yeah, sure. So I sat down and I spoke with her. And we talked about some things. And then I asked her, I said, well, Chocolate, did you ever believe in Jesus? And her response to me was, I don't know. So you take a situation like this where someone who definitely appeared to be a Christian, even a Christian leader, has now converted to a different faith. But remember, what I already said is that if, if someone has genuinely come to Christ, they cannot be lost, right? So what do you do with that? Okay, so if chocolate did come to Jesus, and if Chocolate believed in Jesus during her college years or any time before, or any, at any point in her life, she cannot be lost, even if she's practicing a different faith. This is not my opinion. This is the truth of Scripture. It's what it says in John 6, 37, John 6, 39. If, if Chocolate's dress is now different, if she's now reading out of a different book, that's fine. But she cannot be lost because the Bible says she can't be lost. And so when you think about it, this is encouraging for some of us who have known Christians who have, quote, unquote, fallen away from the faith. Because if those Christians who have, have genuinely come to Christ, but they've fallen away from the faith, if that's taken place, but they've come to Christ at some point, we know that God is keeping them like the prodigal. So it can be encouraging for some of you. You know, you know people and they're like, yeah, I was a Christian, but it's like, man, I don't see any like fruit in your life. Are you sure you never go to church? You never say anything about God? It looks like you've totally fallen off. But I ask you a question about Jesus. You're like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, he's my savior. So, I mean, but it, it is encouraging. Like, even if the people are, you know, far away, uh, we know that God can keep those people. So, but on the other hand, if, if chocolate never came to Jesus, Jesus has no responsibility to keep what was never given to him by the Father. So if she was never saved in the first place, there, there's no responsibility to keep her, right? She was never saved. So those who have, uh, quote unquote, fallen away, they may have never been saved in the first place. So for chocolate and other people you may know, uh, truthfully, only God and the individual in question know the decision that they made about Jesus. She told me, I don't know. And maybe that's just what she said at that moment in time, but she knows. She knows if you have the son, you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. If you don't have the son, you don't have eternal life. John says, I write these things so that you know that you have eternal life. This is the assurance of salvation. So I'm uh, confident and convinced that Jesus is able to do his Father's will and that Jesus will do his Father's will. Jesus is not gonna miss on his Father's will. And whenever I see the Father's will in the Bible, I'm careful to pay attention so in verse 39, you see, this is the will of my father. So I'm like, oh, okay, what is the father's will? I want to know that I should lose nothing. I believe that Jesus 
uh, will accomplish that on the last day. Verse 40, this is the will. Oh, this is the Father's will again. What is his will? I want to know what his will is. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Jesus is good for it. He's going to accomplish his Father's will. He accomplished his Father's will on the cross. We have already seen that take place. He rose again. He accomplished his Father's will. He will continue to accomplish his Father's will. Jesus will return from heaven because that's his Father's will. He's going to accomplish that. Um, He uh, will be the righteous judge. So the keeping power of Jesus, think about the keeping power of Jesus, that Jesus is able to keep any genuine believer in Christ, even if they've fallen away. Now, if they never, if they just appeared to be a believer, but they were never really a believer. See, people can fool us, but they can't fool God. So if they were never really saved, Jesus don't got to keep nothing that he never really had, right? Right? But the keeping power of Jesus will raise believers to the resurrection of life on the last day. And unbelievers will be raised to the resurrection of condemnation on the last day. And Jesus will be the righteous judge who will do his father's will on the last day. Another thing about salvation that, that uh, is important um, that we can kind of get confused on sometimes is eternal life is not based on feelings or performance. It's not based on feelings or performance. Let me start with the feelings. Um, <laughs> feelings will not get you to heaven. So you can feel a certain way about Jesus, feel a certain way about God, Um, But feelings are not going to get you into heaven. Uh, Most of the funerals that I attend, you will um, see someone who who will say um, they're emotionally optimistic while that person is in a better place. But the Bible says that few go through the narrow gate and go to eternal life. It doesn't say most, it says few. It says most are on the wide road that leads to destruction. So there's this big line that extends miles and miles and miles, and people are trying to get in through the wrong door. And then there's this side door that you can go in, but everyone's stuck in the line. There's a side door you can get in, but you can only get in the side door if you know somebody. If you know Jesus Christ, you can get in the side door. And at the end of the day, there's only going to be few that inherit eternal life, not most. And so people will say at funerals that he or she is in a better place. Well, that's probably true at few of the funerals, but most of the time they're not in a better place. You're in your feelings. You want them to be in a better place, but they're not in a better place. So eternal life is not based on feelings. Now let's get to the performance. So with the performance, if you've been going to this church for, for, for some time, you, you probably know this, but maybe you're new and you don't know this. Well, you cannot um, earn salvation with good works, okay? You can't earn your way into heaven, like even these people from the crowd, they're saying, oh, Jesus, what do I have to do? What work do I have to do to go to heaven? But you can't earn it, okay? A good verse for that is Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. It says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So that's a good verse for that. But, but here's something that's important to understand. If you cannot earn salvation with good works because it's a gift, it's from God, it's by grace, so I can't earn it with good works, then you can't lose it with bad works, right? But that's what happens when you don't feel saved. It's like, 
Oh, am I losing my salvation? Am I not good enough? My performance is not good enough. Does my good outweigh my bad? So Christians have accepted that you cannot earn salvation by good works. By grace, you have been saved through faith. But sometimes we forget on the flip side, if that's the case, if it's a gift, how could we lose salvation by bad works? You can't do that. So let me break it down then. So a genuine Christian who has fallen away from the faith, maybe that be chocolate, maybe that be you, maybe that be someone that you know, cannot lose their salvation, but what they are losing is their rewards. So these people will still be in heaven, but they're going to regret the choices that they made because they can't lose their salvation, but they're losing their rewards. What rewards? They're losing fellowship with Jesus on earth. They're losing the ability to pray and to communicate to the Father. They're losing a community of believers to encourage them. They're losing a small group community like a life group. They're losing uh, their eternal crowns. We talked about crowns that you'll get for heaven, eternal rewards. The apostle Paul tells us to run the race like we're going to win so that we can get the crown, but not a, a perishable crown, but an imperishable crown. The Bible talks about these different crowns that elders will receive, a crown that you'll receive for enduring temptation, a crown that you'll receive for loving the appearance of Jesus. So these people are not losing their salvation, they're losing their rewards. Since we're in John 6, let's just go over to John 10, and we're gonna look at John 10, 28 through 29. And John 10, 28 through 29 is talking about Jesus as a shepherd and knowing his sheep and his sheep knowing him. Verse 28 of John 10 says, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. <laughs> Jesus and his father, they have a strong grip, right? So if any of you have ever lifted weights before, when you lift heavy weight, sometimes you can lose your grip. And you have to wear these things called weightlifting straps because it, it, it helps st strengthen you so you don't have to worry about a weak grip. But the, the grip of Jesus and the grip of his father when it comes to people who, who have come to him and believe in him is so strong, no one can loosen that grip. So that's why I say that those who have genuinely come to Jesus cannot be lost. And those who have never come to Jesus, Jesus has no responsibility to keep someone who has never come to him. So what did we learn today, Antioch? Well, number one, we learned today that Jesus is all that we need. Jesus is the bread of life. He is all that we need. We learn today that Jesus has keeping power and that he will keep any person who comes to him. When you don't feel saved, remember these verses in John 6, that by no means will you be cast out and, and I'll accomplish my Father's will and I will lose nothing. And we also learn that Jesus and his Father, they have a strong grip. You can't, you, you, you can't get into that grip. Once you've come to Jesus, your et eternal um, salvation is absolutely secure. So be encouraged today. 
and remember when you don't feel saved, go back to these scriptures and have these scriptures inform your feelings. And if you've never come to Christ, uh, the invitation stands. Come to me. And once, once you come to him, once you put your faith in him, once you repent from your sins, it's like, man, you're, you're in his grip and you're definitely going to heaven. Let us pray together.